totally and everybody welcome. Okay, thank you, Simon. Well, I've had the pleasure of speaking at all of these, and uh, that's where the title comes from, because <coughs> I've made small contributions in the first and the second. If you miss either, don't worry. I think the things will be self-explanatory where you get in. And the idea was to present some of the more vision-based aspects of the project in terms of how they've evolved over the years. Uh, present a couple of concrete examples and kind of make suggestions where we think we're going from here. So for example, when you get your workshop this afternoon about the analysis, that's the analysis as it stands, but there's stuff to be implemented still, which is amongst others the most exciting bits of it. So. You know, it's good to see the before picture and know what the potential's going to be. And so this is my next step. And it starts with, <coughs> well, what happened in, in these other two and what am I going to do now? In the first symposiums, those who were there all those months ago, I presented a four-part question saying that in analysis, uh, in general, but in specifically electroacoustic analysis, you don't say I analyze a piece. There's more to it than that. I'm going to go back to that and see how that's evolved in these recent months. And the end of that one, I also gave an example that even though uh, you have choices of how you go about analysis, there might be some things that are genre specific that might be worth considering. And I presented an example then, which I'll return to, uh, regarding sample-based music. And then <coughs> in February, um, I uh, presented the start of an analytical framework, a template uh, that might be useful for some people that are going to use the software or just have other goals in mind, uh, but that also would be used for those contributing to the book, which is one of the outcomes of the project. So <coughs> the four-part question, and uh, we said at the time, both Simon and I, it's just, it, the order doesn't really matter, it's what tools or approaches which works or genres, for which user, and with which intention. And we put some flesh on the bone, uh, and I would note that with the exception of a couple of things, all of the tools and approaches that we know that are existing and can be formalized are now on Orama and are being implemented into e-analysis. So the US team, and uh, Thorson's, uh, Thorson's graphic symbol, and Stefan Roy's uh, contribution, they're all there. But our hope is that more such things will be invented and be of use to more than the author or him or herself. And also that these things can be put onto Orama and can be implemented into the analysis. Um, with which works or genres? Well, uh, Orama is expanding and has expanded enormously uh, during the year. And my uh, particular happiness is it's not only expanded in, in the quantity of items, but the diversity of the types of music that have gone in as well. And having Ben and Andy here represent two departures that I hope and that I welcome very strongly. And that's going to be reflected in the, the part three of the book where people are presenting analyses over a broad Horizon. And now, which users? That was the thing that I kind of spent the most time in the beginning. I'm not going to really get into that terribly much, other than to say that most people associate analysis with action. Um, the composers and musicians uh, could use analysis for very specific creative goals in non real time, and ideally, and that will be after the project, also in real time. And of course, analysis is often used in this as well but normally for specialists. And of course, one of my big pleas is that it's used for non-specialists, for example, younger people. And I'll give you an example of that at the end of my talk. And intentions, well, the template is developed, so I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, <coughs> the one thing I want to uh, stress that I've mentioned before, but I thought I would illustrate today, is that it is possible that you can have different intentions in one piece. That's kind of obvious, but maybe people haven't thought about that. And that you could actually use a single tool uh, with different types of pieces, some less evident than others. So I came up with a couple of examples which took about 30 seconds, uh, but could come up with hundreds of others if uh, requested. Three intentions for one piece uh, would be the relationship between order and disorder, which is a parameter I mentioned in the template, and narrative discourse on the one hand, and layering or simultaneities in a piece, so the horizontal and vertical relationship. Similarly, you can look at the relationship between source identification and, and these things, 
and also the relationship between order and disorder and structure in a work X by composer Y. Um, again, you could just take any of these out and replace it with virtually anything else, and you still could do that with a piece and make a valid analysis. In terms of three genres, one tool, um, the example that I came up with rapidly was sound recurrence and variation through sound spotting. So when we have an expert system, we'll have sound spotting to be analogous. Um, in an acousmatic, in a lowercase sound, and a sound art work. You could do that with all three genres with equal validity. Now, moving on to um, the template, uh, Simon and I have gone back and forward with that for the authors of the book many times. And we've kind of reduced a longer list to this. I don't think I need <coughs> to get into any depth with any of these. I actually did before. The one thing I would say is that behavior, materials, and ordering do kind of go hand in hand quite a lot. And that can be combined with a lot of things. As you get further down the list, you get to the less obvious uh, aspects of analysis, but that doesn't in any way decrease their importance. The fact that certain types of music are presented in a social setting, and the social setting has implications for the music, should neither be ignored nor undervalued. The fact that we're interested, as Gary spoke about that last time very, very uh, strongly and gave us lots of things to think about, how we deal with emotions in terms of analysis how we deal with meaning, whatever the hell you want that to mean with an analysis. Those genre-specific things, which I'll come back to in a second, and of course, leaving the door open, this is not complete. Any contributions to this template and to the idea of things that we should all be thinking about are more than welcome. <coughs> uh, to merge what I presented in the second symposium with these ones that were just written in italics, again, I'm not gonna get into any depth, I think they're all self-explanatory, so it's had a good read. Uh, particularly in ordering gets split up into a lot of little things. Those parameters I mentioned, including order and disorder, that was in that example just now. Um, there's much more that could be brought up here. Intention and reception and dramaturgy came up quite a lot at EMS last week, much to my pleasure. Uh, performative aspects. Analysis sometimes ignores performance, but in performance has a lot to do with the sonic results and the audiovisual results, so it should be included, and so on and so forth. So that's basically the uh, previous slide split into two and elaborated. Now, to get into the second part, and uh, well, the final part of my talk, um, it, you can talk, keep talking about talking about for years in a project. Um, I get kind of bored with that after a while. And sooner or later, you got to do something. Now, fortunately, <coughs> Pierre had a beta version of the software, which was robust enough to really just try some of these things out. Now, what I'm not going to do is a systematic walk with the template, because I can't do it in 20 minutes or the 10 minutes that remain, but give an indication about how to go about it. Um, but I'm going to do this with a dual purpose in mind. Well, it's actually three. I mentioned uh, genre-specific elements of analysis. I'm going to come back to that. <coughs> I mentioned that we're doing analyses for this book, and I wanted to do a sample-based piece. Trevor Wishart's piece definitely is perfect for that. Um, but I also wanted to look at the four-part question and do something that maybe somebody else doing an analysis for a CUP book wouldn't do. Um, I wanted to do analysis for kids. So I had to choose a piece of music that would work with kids and a way of doing the analysis that could be useful in school. So I've chosen one of the two scenes that are entitled Children's Stories from Trevor Wishart's recent piece, Magnus Opus, Encounters in the Republic of Heaven. This is a two and a half minute section of Act Two. Um, and I'm just going to give you a ve very simple sense of, of how I'm going to go about it, or how I have gone about it, and how they live. <coughs> First of all, to do an analysis for kids, you can't assume they know anything or much about electroacoustic music, or contemporary music, or a heck of a lot of kind of music that they don't listen to 
about how to sleep or get as the you know known diet for whatever curriculum they're doing. <coughs> so something along the lines of can you make music with sound is inevitable here. But in this particular case, can you make a piece of music with speaking voice? That's not a difficult one with kids because everyone's heard rap. So making a link with something that they've got already and then putting it into this. And then can you turn spoken sounds into something more musical or something different that's musical? And finally, and this is something I used to do with undergraduates when I taught the basics of electroacoustic music, <coughs> is a spoken voice chromatic? Well, you speak English, so you understand what I'm saying, and you're not following the melody. If I played my voice backwards to you, added a little bit of reverb, you'd hear the melody, and it is virtually chromatic. Um, and they'll, they'll get that, because as soon as Trevor Wishart processes the voice, you're into a chromatic field, which is quite interesting. So those are some leaders that can get them, you know, their appetite to wet uh, when, when doing a piece. Now, uh, again, I'm not going to get into any details, but I couldn't possibly do an analysis without identifying who Wishart is and where he fits in the greater scheme of things, and where this fits within his work and within electrophysic music and music in general. So that will be something I'm writing about, but not talking about it. Those genre-specific questions that I put up at uh, <coughs> Symposium 1, I'm not going to do all of them, but some of them are quite interesting. For example, <coughs> they're all kids' voices. The whole piece is based on recording to kids. That he made with them, based on some little workshop challenges and just having them say things uh, spontaneously, but with the agreement of the children, the parents, and the teachers. And he claims, for those that have heard him talk about the piece, that once he'd made his sections, he went back to all the people he recorded to get their approval. Now, whether he got that from all the kids or not, I'm not going to bother to investigate. But, um, that's very interesting. So you've got kids' spoken voices that were used legally. They have been modified and how they're treated. They're treated with respect for the kids, but with the idea to get musical goals that I'll talk about in a minute. And what role do those samples play in the performance? They're the whole basis of it in this case. That's kind of obvious. And uh, we don't need to deal with the last question here. <coughs> Some things that need to be discussed for somebody who's not used to this, is I've taken the Katsekut or everybody else's four or five or three or two down to two. And here, I'm hearing something that has to do with reality. Here, I'm listening to sound. Heightened listening, reduced listening. Um, they probably know themes and variations, and if they don't, that can be introduced very quickly, and that's what's going on in this piece, which I'll identify. And Trevor, when we talked about doing this, was really enthused by doing something for kids and said, okay, there's one thing you really need to know. <coughs> when I was recording all these voices in this piece, if you don't know the story, he was in residence in the northeast of England. He recorded people, mainly with very strong Geordie dialect, um, to kind of demonstrate the beauty of the dialect. I don't think he's using it ironically, although some of the sentences are self-effacing. Um, and so you just have to take that into account. But he said, I was interested in the harmonic relationships that can come out of this stuff, the spectral relationships, the rhythmical relationships, and the melodic relationships. So I had four terms that have taken, well, three of them directly from note-based music, and one that's more to do with electric music, but all four of which can be used in this context. And that forms another basis of an analysis. So <coughs> just like any analyst, I had to learn the piece, play it again and again and again and again and again, and start taking some notes. Um, and these notes get me almost halfway through this little section. That's just what I started with. Um, I saw his transcription of the voices, didn't agree with it completely, did my own. Um, and once I got that, I started adding things about which of the four parameters are really in the foreground when he starts manipulating the voices. Um, and furthermore, I'll talk about some of the manipulations without getting too technical, because kids aren't going to grab it. They're going to get some of it, but not all. Okay, at this point, if I can pull it off, is control tab. Basically, looking at graphic things, am I putting the analytical point?
There is a key you're going to see in a minute, but just to give you a hint, capital letter is where we are in terms of the text, so the further you get down, the further you get a new text. Small letters refer to that. So if an A comes with an A and a, an apostrophe, it's still got to do with the Humpty Dumpty bit and not a second type of reverberation or something like that. The graphic symbols are all explained in the key. In this case, it's just Humpty or Humpty Dumpty, and then it's like a whole cluster of them happening together. That's a texture. Every color of those lines is a different kind of manipulation, um, and they're all very, very easy for a kid to grasp once they've heard it once. So fasten your seatbelts. Here's two minutes and 35 seconds of a really nice piece. Humpty Dumpty, that on the wall, Humpty Dumpty, how you get from, you know, I don't know. Old kid horses, old kid men, trying to put up teeth together again. You know what it was. <laughs>
Yeah, Tony Portley, so are you, uh, kids, um, junior school, seniors? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said it. Everything that we're doing at the moment, uh, because I've got my big years project for kids, Key Stage 3 oh. is the heart of the matter, 11 to 14. Yeah. Having said that, one of the PhDs here has reached down to year 5 primary. And some of the people are thinking of doing older groups, and believe it or not, one of John Richard's students has the guts of going into primary schools next year and doing hacking. So we'll see. Uh, but right now, Key Stage 3 seems to be at the heart, John. Thanks for the question. I should have said it. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> 